All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, I know it's actually a nice day outside and not too cold, so appreciate you all taking the time to be in sitting with us. My name is Will Carter. I'm the Deputy Director of the Tech Policy Program here at CSIS. Uh, and it is my pleasure and honor to, uh, to welcome our keynote speaker today, uh, Suzette Kent, who is the Federal Chief Information Officer at the Office of Management and Budget, uh, has been kind enough to grace us with her presence this afternoon. Um, she has been a leader in both the private sector and in government on the issues that we're going to be focusing on today for many, many years. Um, before joining OMB, she most recently served as a principal at uh, EY and was previously at Accenture and the Carriker Corporation. And before that was a managing director at JP Morgan. So I won't hold that against you despite being a <laughs> Goldman vet myself. Um, but Suzette is really one of the leading voices in the federal government on these issues. She leads the team at OMB that really is on the front lines of dealing with the issues we're going to be talking about today. Um, today's topic is focused on the issue of, we called it extending federal cybersecurity to the endpoint. Uh, but really, I think what we were trying to understand in the study that led up to this was how changes in the technology landscape are changing the needs of the federal government, the way that we need to think about procuring all of the digital systems and devices that are part of federal networks today. Um, as I mentioned, Suzette and her team are the ones that are really, they're the leaders on this. They're the ones who are setting the policy, figuring out how to address all of the challenges that we highlighted in our study. Um, following Suzette's keynote, we are lucky enough to have uh, two members of the working group that actually helped us to put together this study, as well as Todd Gustafson from uh, HP, um, who have been great partners in this process throughout. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Suzette to give us some introductory remarks, and I uh, look forward to hearing from her. All right, we were having so much fun talking back here they had to actually uh, drag us out but uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and for my friends on the reporter side it's been a big day so we've had a lot to talk about <laughs> today um, thank you to the center uh, for bringing this group here today and, and in the opening you talked about how we have to continue to evolve our policy and our thinking, and we have to move at the same pace that the technology is moving. Um, so we appreciate individuals like you who are in the room who not only are learning or commenting, but also pushing us to continue to move as quickly as possible and being reactive and proactive to the challenges that we're seeing in, in the environment. And so, um, my remarks today are actually going to also highlight a piece that was in the report when I looked through the report that extending the federal cybersecurity to the endpoint aligns with our approach to IT modernization in that it's holistic. And it includes the technology, it includes how we look at devices, it includes how we look at people um, and how we enable people and data. And I'm going to make some comments in each of those areas. And that it is an iterative process. And that it is at its most healthy state when we have constant feedback and continuous change from both industry and private sector side. So um, you, you commented. I've had uh, spent a long time in the technology community, particularly in financial services. And I have a keen appreciation for the protection of data and network security, and very importantly, the ramifications to customer trust when those things are not upheld. And when we're not ahead of those who would pose an attack. And as an American citizen, I'm also here, and I am thrilled to be in the role of the federal CIO because I saw an administration in Congress that placed such a high importance on cybersecurity. And it is one of our national imperatives. And the commitment to action is loud and clear. I'm going to name just a couple of things that, that um, will relate to, to other comments. We have a national cyber strategy for, for the first time in 15 years. We have multiple pieces of legislation that look at our entire infrastructure. It looks at how we treat our networks. It looks at behaviors around people and our supply chain. We have executive orders and agency programs and very public metrics 
um, under FISMA and FATARA. I joked earlier today I'm wearing blue, my favorite color on the FATARA scorecard, blue for A. Um, but, it, but it's also um, interesting that just this September, we made it to the point where all agencies were actually connected to DHS's um, CDM dashboard. That was just getting connected. That's just knowing what's going on. And now we have to position ourselves to continue to act on that and to behave as an enterprise as we manage risk. The responsibility does lie at the agencies to protect their network, their systems, and to know what's going on. But we have to protect our entire federal enterprise in looking at it almost like an entire company. Um, everyone in this room knows that we're never done. It doesn't stop. And that's something that's different in this space than other spaces and places where we look at change in the federal government. A project has a natural start and end. This does not. We don't have a natural start and an end. We have what's next. And we need to move into a state where our incidents are less costly, they're less disruptive, and we get there by investing in our technology, our people, and processes to ensure that our infrastructure is more modern. That's why I link cybersecurity and IT modernization. It's a lot easier to protect what's current. It's really hard to protect some of our very aged systems. Um, it's also very expensive, and that doesn't put us in the position to be the best stewards of taxpayer money. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the, the pieces. I, I highlighted some of the various legislative actions. Um, we, we do have commitment at the highest level. The, when we talked about um, executive orders, so 13800, strengthening cybersecurity of federal networks and critical infrastructure. We will continue to work on that. We've made significant progress, and over this last time, you actually saw the FISMA scores go up, but they're, they're not blue yet. They're not A's. Um, we need to keep moving. There was a set, uh, there was a report out to the president on IT modernization that had 52 tasks. I shared this morning that we actually finished those 52 today. That's a great accomplishment, but that was last year's list. We have a whole new list for this year, and those tasks informed the areas that we're going to make investments and advances going forward. I'll use one of the examples of high value assets and how we look at high value assets. On the first pass, we identified some data sets and, and things. But we didn't include all agencies, only the CFO Act agencies. And when we said value, we didn't invite, we, we didn't um, look at value in, in a kind of full comprehensive manner. That's what the new policy actually does. Um, I mentioned the national cyber strategy. It has four pillars. The main pillar that we're focused on on the federal side is the one for under protecting the American people um, that is securing federal networks and their information. And that's what I spend my time with our federal CIOs and CISOs focused on, is how we protect the data and the systems that are inside the federal government. So I'm gonna highlight just a couple of things. I know you have an esteemed panel that's gonna get into some real meat of exactly how we're doing this, but I'm gonna talk about the high points across some of the agencies. So we're working with DHS, um, and the new CISA, um, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, to continue continue to centralize how we manage threat information and how we look at our enterprise as a network. And through some of the new things, DHS will actually be connecting more deeply with industry. And by sharing threat information, that is how we become we we put ourselves in a position to be more proactive and prepare and have a view of what's going on. I shared uh, when we were in the green room having fun, uh, talking with representatives from other nations about how we look at threat information that's coming in from various places so we can make priority choices about where we put our resources. Many times we know we can't do everything. We have to have a risk framework and a risk mindset in all the actions that we take. So I talked about CDM. It is critical to the visibility of the hardware and software assets, whether they are on-premise or on the cloud. And one of the other recent updates, um, through experimentation, we also have some agencies who have found even more efficient ways to communicate that information. Um, our updates to the TIC policy, which will be out next week, 
Very happy. That's our last piece of major policy um, for which we wanted to update, ensure that it is modern, current, put it out for public comment. Will help us streamline agencies' efforts to move to multi-cloud environments um, where we, we need to look at a different approach to security and data storage. And we're also looking at um, probably the area that I'm very excited about the intersection of identity improvements, data usage, and zero trust architecture. So when, again, when we think about the holistic environment, identity and the en enhancements in identity are really important to who is accessing. And as we invest in data um, taxonomy and what we're doing with data to make it available, who we let have access to that data is an important part of the question. And how we marry those two and what someone is doing in our applications is a very important nexus of components and, and we haven't architected with that mindset. So as we think going forward about how we let individuals access our data, we want to be open, but we have to protect security, privacy, and other things, and we want to know who's using it. And so those are some very critical things that our um, data strategy under the President's Management Agenda is looking at in conjunction with IT modernization and the partnership with data um, and how we look at various networks. I already mentioned the fact that um, we're looking at how we better align risk management and we ensure that we have the right skills in the right places. So that includes things like having, making sure that federal CIOs and CISOs have information and authority that they need to make both hiring decisions and procurement decisions. Again, thinking about that risk framework and what they choose to prioritize. Um, I already mentioned most many of the policy updates, um, but we're also very active right now with things around supply chain and how we create more structure and how we manage supply chain. Um, and we can, again, look at that proactively and not be reactive after something has happened. And we'll continue to work with Congress on that. The, um, and many of you probably followed some of the things that went on in um, the news uh, with Kaspersky Labs, but that was an area where we didn't have a formal process defined. We built one and we moved quickly, but we want to make sure that we have opportunity to be proactive and that we have close connectivity with all the agencies and that they're clear about what's on their network um, at any time that we have a question or we want to reassess risk. And then we're going to continue to look at what we do with federal contractors um, in going through the, the list of things um, in, that I have done, one of my last sets of activities in the financial services environment was looking at third party risk for the financial services industry as a whole. And what we hold ourselves accountable for, we have to hold our contractors accountable for as well. And when we look at many of the issues and things that, um, that we're trying to grapple with, we want to bring our trusted contractor community with us and ensure that those same things are happening. So as part of the cloud strategy, um, we, are, we are working on, um, I'm gonna highlight one of the things with cloud email, we're working with OMB, GSA, and the DOD to ask our vendors to be innovative, but also that we're collectively meeting the same set of security requirements um, and that we're using, we're doing that and facilitating that by linking the acquisition community to the technology community by using a common contractual vehicle. So I know there was also some points in the study about how we link the knowledge that's in IT to um, our acquisition side and keep those close. That's one of the ways that we're actually trying to do that. Um, when we talk about threat vectors, part of the reason we're focusing on email, it's one of the ways, you know, still when you look at our, where our threats are coming from, there's a big chunk that's coming from email. It's, it, it is um, a significant enough chunk that that is why we are 
focusing on ensuring all of our agencies have modern tools. We are at, um, we've moved from less than 40% to almost 70%, and all but two agencies actually have an active program um, where they're transitioning right now. So that's gonna give us, position us to have modern tools, more effective, um, as well as provide the security that we're after. And I'll end my comments on um, the most important part of the consideration, which is people. Even when we talk about um, when we talk about email and we talk about threats, a big part of that is people. We can do so much with technology, but people behavior continues to be important. Um, so we've focused in across many different layers on how we address individual behavior, whether it's about their devices, information sharing, or use. We're also investing in our cyber workforce. Uh, one of the things that I've been very uh, close to lately and happy to be sharing with this community is a couple weeks ago, we kicked off our first Cyber Reskilling Academy. And what we want to do, and if anyone's interested, it's on cio.gov backslash reskilling. What we intend to do there is look across our federal community for people who aren't in the IT space right now provide a skills assessment, and based on certain aptitudes, we're going to select individuals to participate in a cybersecurity program to become cyber analysts. And we're very excited about the program because it's, we, we've seen it be successful in other countries and in private sector industry, but we're doing this as a joint pilot with the CIO Council um, and working with Department of Education, because what, we, what outcomes we're trying to achieve is to build the workforce of the future that we've already defined that we need, but we want to make those investments in our existing federal workforce and people who, may, who already know the mission space and quite frankly, they've already passed the background and security checks. So when we look at that from a timeline perspective, we can get talented people into roles much more quickly. And um, this program is gonna end in the summer. And after the end of that program, it, we're gonna kind of assess the outcomes across all the agencies. And hopefully this will be something that we're gonna continue to do forward. But that's not the only thing. We have three other programs that are come, gonna come next year. We have actually four sets of focus. And what we're intending to do is to build the cyber workforce that we need. I've talked openly in many cases, many of you sitting in this crowd know very well that it is a battle right now in this space. Also makes everyone here really valuable. <laughs> um, but across, the, across private sector and public sector, we need more professionals in this space. So the way that we get there um, is making some investments in building the skills that we need, whether it's bringing people in that have the right aptitudes, whether it's investing in the people that are already in the practice that we're gonna to continue to expand their skills and ensure that they have the, the most current capabilities that they need, or in some of the programs where we develop our next leaders and our next leaders across the agencies. So I know you have a, I, I tried to hit a lot of pieces real quick to give you a broad perspective of the things that we are focusing on. Um, you have a great panel. I know Ryan, Dan, and Todd are gonna go into all kinds of deeper uh, ways that we can take action, but let me kind of end where I began. We've accomplished a lot this year, but think about that as the foundation and that's the stepping stone to all the things that we need to do next year. In the cyberspace, we have to move much more quickly than almost any other area of you know, our professionals across the federal workforce. So that takes different tactics. It takes a different level of tension. You've already seen that we have the support from both the administration and Congress, and we're gonna continue to move very, very aggressively. Um, it's not only a commitment, but it's an expectation that we believe our American citizens have. So I thank you for your time and your investment here today, um, your thoughts about how we continue to accelerate and where we make those investments so that we can create an enterprise risk framework um, and build the technology capabilities and the people capabilities that we need for the future.
So thank you. Where are we on time? Checking with you on time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So if our panelists can join me up here. Thank you. Do you want to say any order? Hmm? Doesn't matter. Now you're really going to get that. All right, well, I want to thank Suzette again, um, who is out of the room, so I don't have to be so profuse with my thanks. Uh, but I thought she did a great job of framing the issues and also giving us some great background on all the work that's being done by her office in this space. I think for everyone up here today, uh, this set of issues has been uh, you know, the center of their professional lives for a very long time. And you know, seeing all these issues as they've evolved in the federal government, um, it's encouraging to know that there's still a lot of work being done and so much progress being made across the board. Um, I am extremely pleased uh, to be joined today by such fantastic experts in this space. Uh, I won't go into exactly how many decades of collective experience are represented on our panel. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, if you've seen their bios, Dan's bio, for example, is like five pages long, uh, which reflects uh, his many, many accomplishments in this space, if nothing else. Uh, but I want to introduce each of our speakers briefly. Um, so Dan Chinock, to my left, uh, is the um, executive director of the IBM Center for the Business of Government. Uh, Dan has been in the cybersecurity space in both government and private sector roles for a very long time, uh, including previously serving at OMB, uh, leading the uh, IT tech practice there for a number of years. And um, he also is one of our, our most frequently tapped experts here at CSIS. We shamelessly exploit his expertise on these issues. Um, and he's been a member of both of our cybersecurity commissions, uh, most recently uh, leading up to the 2016 election, identifying key priorities for the next president. Uh, but Dan, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, Ryan Gillis is the Vice President for Cybersecurity Strategy and Global Policy at Palo Alto Networks, um, a cybersecurity company. He has been in this field for a very long time, um, 15 years in the federal government in a variety of roles, and he's also been in the uh, startup industry. Uh, he's been in the defense industry, really a wide range of experience on exactly these issues we're talking about today. Uh, most recently, Ryan was at the White House uh, with the NSC and received the Outstanding Service Award. Um, for his really fantastic work on this. Ryan is, uh, you know, widely acknowledged one of the leading folks in DC on these issues. And then Todd Gustafson. Um, Todd is the president of HP Federal, um, which is a part of HP uh, overseeing their federal business, providing IT innovation, uh, enabling business outcomes, and supporting HP's direct US government end users and agencies. Um, Todd has, I am amazed to see this, he has began his career at HP in 1987 um, and has really been involved in key roles across the company for decades. Um, He's in channel sales, account management, new account development, region management, and now leads the US federal business. Um, so really, it's a pleasure to have you here today uh, representing the private sector view. Uh, I think the vendors who are on the other side of a lot of these issues, as Suzette mentioned. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, before we get started with our conversation, I want to just go across, uh, get some opening thoughts from each of you. Um, I know you have much to say on this topic. Um, I should also say, I mentioned earlier, but Dan and Ryan um, were, were generous enough to participate in the working group that helped us to develop this study. Um, Todd's colleagues at HP were also involved in that. So we want to thank you all for your contributions there as well um, and also for being here today. So Dan, why don't you kick us off? Sure. And I have a real time um, reason why this is such an important topic. I mentioned to Ryan just before the talk, I got a text. My boyfriend just sent me this. It's worth $900. Click here. <laughs> uh, I, deleted, the I, I deleted it. Yeah. I didn't click it. Um, so we need uh, tech security as well as email, I think, uh, uh, is what, what that talks about. Um, so I think that this is obviously a really important uh, discussion that CSIS has, has done. I'm happy to be here to be with such an esteemed panel. Thanks, Will, for, for the invitation to join it. And I know that there are a number of experts 
out there who I've learned from over the years. Um, who, um, so hopefully we can get into an interactive discussion. Um, one of the things I think that's important to think about and sort of think about endpoint and user centricity, which the paper uh, talked about, was that there's the user-centered architectures that, that are in the paper. There's also the need for policy and education because the workforce that uses cyber is a lot bigger than the cyber workforce and creates a lot more vulnerability and risk in terms of their just lack of understanding about all the people that might click on a text like the one uh, that I just read. And so some of the basic sort of policy and education work is, is both about the cyber workforce, but in many ways from a risk perspective, it's, it's more about, and volume, it's more about sort of how, how we think about the workforce as a whole and how we think about educating that workforce in terms of their responsible use of cyber. Uh, I think that's in, especially important as the agencies are adopting more BYOD policies and we have many different types of devices. We have IoT uh, connections into the network. Um, so the endpoint is looks a lot different than it did 10 years ago and it's probably something that, that a lot of people, um, especially policymakers, not just here but around the world, really are just starting to think about how do we think about endpoint security in a world where devices can be anywhere from your palm to your refrigerator to your car uh, to your hospital bed and um, you know how do you kind of build that and how do you build uh, authentication uh, how do you think about data security in that kind of world where, where there's a lot of structured data and unstructured data of different kinds coming in? And so thinking about multiple layers of security, and I think the, the paper talked about protecting the network layer uh, as a key element. And I'd, I'd add on sort of a defense in depth uh, uh, approach, which many people in the room know is, is, is a term that we've used for sort of multi-layer security before. I think applying it to an endpoint uh, approach is something uh, that is also critically important. And, and layering in CDM, Suzette talked about the agencies now are, are all CDM linked, layering in sort of an endpoint um, uh, component of the CDM program I think is probably a future uh, useful evolution for the government in terms of all these different applications and how you do security orchestration across this model. And so being a former OMB person uh, like Suzette, I think about the world in terms of how do you lock this in in terms of policy and funding incentives. So I think um, in addition to the good points that the paper raised about NIST guidance and DHS sort of operational leadership, I, I think OMB, and, and we've heard from Suzette that they're taking a number of steps, should be uh, thinking forward about how do we get agencies as they're planning for the 2021 budget um, uh, to uh, enable sort of their, all of their applications to have a cyber layer. And ever since I was at OMB, so this is a 20 year journey, um, we've sort of talked about how do we drive cyber into agencies' investment strategies for technology generally. And sort of framing that as we live now in, a, in the IT space, we talk about an agile world and a user-centric world, making cyber part of those worlds and making agencies sort of uh, think about those, those issues as they frame their investments is something that I think can help agencies continue the evolution in the manner that, that Suzette talked about. Thanks, Dan. Ryan? Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Will, thanks for helping me come to terms with the fact that I'm actually kind of old now. So I appreciate you reminding me a couple of times there. Um, I, I'd suggest we, I, I think the report is great and commend you guys for taking a, a variety of input and, and as Suzette said, a holistic look at this. Uh, I, I would think of the endpoint in, in three main ways. First, um, what is state of the art at the endpoint today, right? So antiviruses antiquated and insufficient at best, but it is still a check the box requirement and does have some capabilities that, um, that can help. But uh, a lot of endpoints right now have 11 agents on them, right? So some of those are to protect against attacks, some of which um, are to, you know, in the CDM vein, to just tell you who's on the network, what is connected to the network, whether or not it's patched and updated. Um, how, are those, how do those things work together? If you, if you look at the development of the cybersecurity industry, and this is a fault of both the vendors and the user community. We found a new problem, we solved that new problem, a small slice of industry developed, and the thought was never given to how does that talk to the rest of the suite of tools that are being used. And that problem exists with 11 agents on the endpoint, and then it expands out from there. So first and foremost, how does your endpoint security work together, and what are the most efficient and effective techniques right now to protect against attacks at the endpoint, because ultimately that's where the delivery occurs in a, in a tremendous amount of these cases. And if you look at the, something like WannaCry, obviously the, the proliferation of impact was where people had not patched adequately. There are technologies, for example, that don't necessarily rely upon the 
attributes of the attack to protect against. So there were a number of endpoints out there using more modern tools that if you defended against the technique, it didn't matter what the new attack looked like. So whether or not the endpoint was patched, as it ought to have been, but it was not in many cases, combine that with um, a traditional legacy approach to that security was if it wasn't patched, then you only stopped something if you knew the attributes of what was coming uh, from the particular attack. So by defending against the technique that was used, and those techniques are usually about two dozen as opposed to with polymorphic malware, it's essentially unending what, what the signatures can look like. So the, what is state of the art is, is first and foremost, is how, and how is that integrated on the endpoint? The second is, and Suzette talked about the, the holistic approach. How is your endpoint ensuring that it holistically works with your cloud security, with your network security, with your data center security, so throughout your entire enterprise? And so one should inform the other. Prevention should be viewed not in this binary sense that if the attacker gets in in any place, then he's successful, because there are steps an attacker needs to take. There are places both to gather data and to enforce security. The endpoint is a critical one, and, and they all must work together. So that, that problem that we developed with 11 endpoint agents that don't talk to each other is then proliferated across the network security. So does your IPS and your IDS talk to your firewall capability? All of those things need to be integrated and work together so that you, you create a technological ecosystem that, that defends you in a, in a holistic way. And by the way, that takes the onus of integration off the network defender. Right, that, that's one of the big challenges right now, and you hear it from customers and clients and users all the time, which is, that's a great innovation. I can't put one more thing in my stack. I can't operate some of these 120 tools that I already have right now. So that is a function of those things not working together in, in microsystems such as the endpoint and, and across the whole network. And then the last piece, and I think the report does a lot of good things on this, how do you align the structures to get the right tools into the hands of the operators in, in a quick and transparent way? And so how do we test effectively? How do we use third parties like Gartner to, so that the government has a starting point for you know, what's effective technology? How is the government looking at tools and evaluations within the government um, that are output focused and focus on operational effectiveness? So things like Dodcar right now that DOD is running that takes the MITRE attack framework, which maps the steps that an attacker needs to take to be successful, and then maps against that the effectiveness of those capabilities. Um, those outputs should not just be used for the program that is running Dodcar. That should be used across the government so that we have effective technologies, and then you don't have to program by program, agency by agency, conduct those same tests and evaluations. So putting those in the right hands, and Suzette also talked, I think, very importantly about alignment of incentives, uh, of incentives uh, for the acquisition community and the contractors. Uh, if you go back to the OPM IG report, it's about 20 pages long, the first 18 pages are, they should have had better tools, they should have had better security, they should have done better. The last two pages are, they should have done a full and open competition that should have taken five more years to put tools in the hands of the first 18 pages. So then they drag a bunch of contractor, contracting officers up there and they say, what, you know, why did you guys not do X, Y, and Z? So the incentives are perverse for the contracting community right now. In a lot of ways, it's to go with the status quo rather than put these innovative tools quickly in the hands of, of the operators. And so how do you align the incentives and the evaluations of those officials to the executive order and the responsibility of department and agency heads to protect their networks? Because if you align that contracting officer incentive, then you can move faster to get those technologies that have been evaluated in operational context and then move fast to put those into the hands of the operators and get it deployed across the networks. So those are sort of the three categories that, that we think about with the endpoint and how it relates to the broader ecosystem. Thanks, Ryan. Todd? We know why you won the award now, so uh, <laughs> Lots of talk. that was uh, good. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Suzette, for, uh, for joining us here today. Uh, I have had uh, a lot of uh, fantastic experience at HP, and when we think about endpoint devices, we think about the actual devices that people are using, my notebook as an example, and the reality is that uh, most of the attacks that happen, as you mentioned, begin right here. And when I grew up, I used to think about the word attack 
and often that word would conjure up a physical attack. I would know that the, the uh, attack was omnipresent in front of me, I know it was coming, and I would figure out how to defend it. The reality is when I talk to my ch our children today about attacks, the word that comes, up to my, comes to mind from their perspective is cyber attacks, those kind, of, uh, those kind of aspects. And the reality is, and I hope this never happens, but it's likely the next conflict that happens will, have, will be a cyber conflict at its core in terms of how a, uh, how a war would be conducted. It won't be necessarily uh, just uh, planes and bombs and bullets, if you will. And so we spent a lot of time, and the government has spent a lot of time on building a fence, if you will, the most secure fence around uh, getting into those networks. And in some cases, they built two fences around that. And the reality is that people have figured out a way to, uh, to attack those fences. And we've developed tools such as email, such as the internet, which are designed to deliver information directly to, uh, directly to endpoint devices. And uh, our first uh, vector of attack on that, or protection, was around antivirus and around uh, what we did with the, uh, with the operating system. The reality is that bad actors have figured out that that's no longer something that they just want to go do, but rather attack the, uh, attack the machine themselves. And so what are companies and what are suppliers doing to uh, make sure they're addressing the fundamental uh, what I would call built-in approach as opposed to bolted-on approach in terms of uh, solving that. That's number one. Number two is uh, the government is spending our taxpayer money, right? And they're trying to, and they've done a, uh, a very effective job with regards to uh, what we call uh, LPTA, lowest price technically acceptable. And uh, I frankly endorse and uh, embrace that approach. Uh, but I, while I think that's a uh, very effective approach for the government to, uh, to do that, we've lost sight of the fact that security needs to be a key element of what they do when they, uh, when they acquire endpoint devices. And it's a unique opportunity for, uh, for customers to go do that. And then the last thing that I would say, and Suzette brought this up, is the whole supply chain aspect of uh, procuring products. We've all, uh, we've all read, the, uh, or many of us have read the Bloomberg article that came out about 30 days ago that talked about what was coined the uh, super micro bug. And at its core, what that, uh, what that article talked about was the fact that uh, through the supply chain process, what was the, uh, there was an opportunity for uh, bad actors, if you will, to place at its core a listing device on every device that was manufactured unbeknownst and undetectable to modern tools that were available. And it's important that agencies and the government, and for that matter, industry, to understand how their products are manufactured, how they were delivered, and how do they get to your desk at the end of the day. So those are things from an endpoint perspective that we, uh, we think about. And very often, we may think about our PCs or our notebooks as that primary device. But the reality is, when you go to hackathons, as an example, and you sit down with kids, the first thing that they do, they go to attack, is they go attack the printer. Because at the end of the day, the printer is just a PC that prints paper, right? And so when we think about end-to-point devices, it's just not device that we carry around and we use, but all aspects of those endpoint devices that are connected. Thank you, Todd. So I want to start off, I think, one of the, the key points that we were interested in as we started this study was something that Todd brought up, which is, the emphasis on lowest price technically acceptable uh, acquisitions for all of these endpoints, for all of these digital systems that are connected to federal networks. And I think one of the things that came out very strongly from our working group discussions, um, and that all of you really touched on today, is the fact that uh, defining technically acceptable um, has not, the definition of technically acceptable has not adequately addressed the security needs. Um, and I thought Suzette made a really interesting point when she talked about the importance of customer trust. I think well, one of the conversations that came up um, in, in our discussions was about 
the need to understand secure and resilient service delivery as a component of performance in the same way that we look at other performance metrics when we're buying systems and designing networks for the federal government. So I wanted to, to get all of your thoughts on this. How do we move the needle on this? How do we get the definition of technically acceptable changed in a meaningful way in each procurement decision and make sure that we're pushing the real uh, needs and standards that we want to meet to the contracting officers to ensure that it's met? Uh, maybe, Dan, you can start off just given uh, your, your long experience thinking about how do you actually push these incentives through the federal machine? How do you drive procurement? Um, so I'm going to borrow a phrase that uh, my boss, Lisa Muscolo uh, at IBM, uh, used recently, which is moving to a world of lowest price technically exceptional. In other words, let's find the technically acceptable solution and then let's compete in the market for what is the best price we can, we can deliver for that. And, and that type of a mindset, if we start kind of think about procurement executives, I think the paper did a good job, and uh, both of the, the, my fellow panelists talked about this, about aligning the, the acquisition team with technical expertise to understand when you're reviewing a solution, what is the technically exceptional level you know, so it's above the floor that, that the agency is looking at. It actually hits a sort of a ceiling target in terms of, of risk reduction through endpoint uh, acquisition. And then how do you build in the incentives so that the, the, the RFP is basically asking the company to drive to a point that's consistent with the agency strategy, that's consistent with the overall policy direction from OMB that's driven through NIST standards. So I think that it's kind of all, all those pieces aligned can get you to a point for, where from a merits perspective, you can think about master data management um, and security, um, or you know, what's the right level of authentication for a device, and sort of building those in to, um, from a policy to a standards to the uh, RFP that involves the technical expert staff. And I think the paper did a really nice job laying that out uh, and getting to an exceptional uh, a place, but still having a good price for the government and the taxpayer. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd go to outputs first, right? So if you, if you look at a traditional way that the government buys, it's RFIs and RFPs that give input specs. And those don't necessarily tell you about the performance. So again, I, I'd go back to an operational testing model that in the real world shows you what is actually on, and you can do this in a contained and modeled environment. It can be based on real world attributes and attacks. Um, what is it that you need to accomplish and how effective are the various technologies you're evaluating against that? And so I, I don't think LPTA really has any place in, in the security business right now. I think we need to move towards something that is, is evolved into what performs best and, and cost is absolutely a factor. I also think we should be looking at, at full ROI. So mm -hmm. a lot of things that are bought under LPTA sneak in because they meet the minimum input objectives in the RFP, and then they add on all these additional task orders to actually accomplish what any of the mission owners require, or they sit on a shelf because nobody's ever gonna use that junk. And so that again is a, is a misalignment oftentimes in the contracting officer shop. So um, we, we need to one, look better at the operational performance, and two, we need to look at, at the holistic cost. What's the upkeep? What additionally is gonna need to be added to that? rather than sort of a, a lot of times those myopic requirements that drive insufficient technology through LPTA. So I would, uh, I would give just a, a little, I think you've, um, colleagues are aligned here, but what I would say is that this is a real leadership opportunity for our government agencies in my mind. And it's gonna start, uh, start with leadership. And if you think about the way the government uh, uh, acquires product, often, Leadership defines what they want to accomplish, right? What is the ultimate goal? How do we want to go do that? And then they work with the contracting agency to determine how do they go out and uh, acquire those products. And often, the left hand isn't necessarily always talking to the right hand. And often, a contracting officer will follow the law, right, uh, with regards to how the uh, actual procurement happens. And so I think there's an opportunity, one, for some of the FAR regulations to be adopted to make sure that they're adhering to NIST standards, right? Mm -hmm. So the government does an amazing job developing these standards that best represent what we call protect, detect, and resolve, right? How are we doing that on endpoint devices? We, we call that resiliency, right? What is the resiliency that you're developing into your products? And so one, I think there's an opportunity for our legislative community to help update the uh, acquisition regulations so that NIST 
is not necessarily a nice to have, but it's a requirement from a uh, procurement standards. And then I th also think it's a leadership opportunity for our agencies to demand, right, that uh, these security protocols are, again, built in versus bolted on to what they're acquiring. It's, Ryan, you mentioned something that um, I know came up multiple times in our conversation and is, uh, is certainly a, a key passion for you, which is this operational testing question. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the challenges is, you know, in your dog car example, um, you know, I think highlights this. How do you figure out uh, who should do the tests, how they should do the tests, and then make sure that the results get disseminated to the right people so that these tests end up turning into real meaningful outcomes in future procurement decisions? So can you talk a little bit about how you think about that? Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of places. So there are existing third parties that are used widely across the industry and I think probably not looked at enough within government. So Gardner and, and NSS Labs and those folks that kick the tires on these sort of things. Um, then you've got centers of excellence, whether it's you know, NIST, uh, NCCOE, uh, MITRE, and, and a lot of the FFRDCs have those capabilities. Johns Hopkins APL, I think, is uh, the basis for both Dodd-Car, or at least the, the housing for both Dodd-Car and what they're calling now GovCar. It originally started as NASCAR, by the way, until the lawyers <laughs> told them they're being, they're infringing copyright there. So. Um, so I think we've got those centers of excellence. There are some pockets within the government and within programs. So um, the point is the resources exist out there and they cannot be replicated in each place. You know, Suzette talked about going beyond the, the CFO Act agencies. So there's 24 or so CFO, CFO Act agencies and then another 120 plus. Those folks are not going to develop their own operational test and evaluation capabilities. And I'd argue most of the CFO Act agencies are not either. So let's, let's identify and define some of these centers of excellence that exist, public and or private, bring transparency to it, and, and then let the results be used sort of worldwide as a, as a justification across mm -hmm. the government. You can create a market for that. I mean, you think about the Energy Star model um, for appliances, where consumers know that if they see that, it's been through testing, it's, it's uh, a, a high performing, energy efficient uh, capability, refrigerator, air conditioner, et cetera. If we have people, in buyers, including government buyers, sort of saying, let's create a program like the one that Ryan's describing. There are models out there across cyber, but we don't have a consistent application in the government procurement space. Are you almost invoking cyber UL? <laughs> <laughs> as long, a voluntary approach. <laughs> yeah, cyber UL, the Underwriters Laboratory, is a, is a project started a few years ago to uh, potentially create a mechanism similar to what Dan is talking about, although I don't know what's hap where the, what the current status yeah, is. What, I don't know. Has much just disappeared? And yeah, I haven't had a CFR briefing on that in like two years, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> so, Todd, I want to talk to you a little bit about, you mentioned the importance of um, the supply chain, and it seems like so much of this is, has got to be driven by the vendors, um, and there's a really important element of not only having vendors on their own initiative do more for security, but having that communication between the government and the vendor community, ensuring that there, there's this constant exchange of information about what is the, the best, what is exceptional, and how do you then establish good standards, the highest possible standards, so that the government can buy the best. So I'm curious, you know, there were a lot of examples that were talked about in, in our working group. I think the FDA was one, you know, the mechanisms that they have to have a constant dialogue with the industry. As someone sitting on the industry side, um, do you feel like these mechanisms are there? Do you feel like you have the opportunity to weigh in? Or how might we, we improve that communication, give you more opportunity to communicate these things to the government? So what I would first say is, <clears throat> I frankly think the government is uh, ahead of industry with when it comes to secure supply chain from my perspective. And it wasn't just a year ago that uh, Social Security Administration put out a uh, uh, several hundred million dollar solicitation for printers, uh, which are core to what Social Security delivers in terms of they're still very uh, paper oriented. And, the, uh, and part of that solicitation, and it was the first time that we've seen it in government, was a very rigorous approach to secure supply chain. And, uh, and along with that secure supply chain, they wanted to know simple things like country of manufacturer, manufacturer, but they also started to ask things like, ownership structures, date of births within that ownership structure, 
key suppliers of those, uh, of those OEMs. And it was a, uh, a fairly rigorous uh, Court of Federal Claims uh, appeal that happened over uh, 18 months that was decided in the, uh, in the favor of Social Security with regards to what they were approaching from, what they were des designing in as part of their acquisition process for uh, secure supply chain. Today you see Department of Homeland Security adopting some similar standards, NASA uh, doing exactly the same thing. And I frankly think um, industry will follow uh, closely behind. A key underlying technology that's not embraced yet that I believe over the next uh, two years will is adopting blockchain technology as a result of uh, what they want to achieve from a supply chain standpoint. So the government can clearly understand where their processors, where their hard drives, where their memory, know exactly when it was manufactured, who manufactured it, when it was delivered, how long has it has been um, on the network, and that every agency can look at by serial number and understand what the, uh, if you will, from uh, cradle to grave uh, of that particular asset so they can determine its worthiness from a security standpoint. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that HP is adopting blockchain to manage its supply chain? We are uh, actively engaged. <laughs> All right, we've mentioned blockchain. The challenge to the other two on the panel is to work artificial intelligence into this discussion <laughs> yeah. at some point. Uh, but I think- But it's real and it works. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll raise you one for quantum. Oh, yes, yes. Always got to have the quantum in there as well. Uh, but I think, you know, it's interesting you bring this up that uh, the government is ahead of industry because I think that's not often the narrative we hear. Um, it, it's always about what can government learn from industry, from the way that industry does procurement, from the way that industry thinks about security. So with the caveat that, that um, you, you have said that industry is behind, are there things the government can learn from industry? And, and are there particular examples that you would give of practices that you think are worth the government looking at? So I'll give you a, uh, so just yesterday, you want to go out and reference this, I read this, and it was, uh, it was published uh, from a group called the Partnership for Public Service. And it talked about employee engagement in the U.S. government. And it said that the employee engagement in the U.S., this is a measure by which uh, both companies and industry talk about how, uh, how good their employees feel as part of their organization, what's the mission, what are the goals. Um, how willing are they to stay there? And the government's response was uh, 62%. Industry, normal industry response is 75%. And uh, in virtually every agency, 60% uh, of the agencies declined over the last three years. So consistent decline from an employee engagement standpoint. And when you think about security, uh, part of what the government is doing is that they're thinking about locking down assets as part of the security process, right? Don't let, uh, don't let devices leave the office, don't let um, any assets leave the office, and therefore it'll be protected uh, within the network. And I'll just mention, given that you brought it up, the Social Security Administration was ranked one of the top agencies within the U.S. government with an employee engagement index that exceeded industry. And one of the things that the Social Security Administration did two years ago uh, was a program which was originally defined as a result of real estate constrictions, is that they were hiring more people, didn't have enough real estate in order to uh, house all those people, house all those employees, and they uh, determined a work at home program. And so for the agency, that was a real mind bender for them to have people not work in a physical office for the government. And as a result of that, they, uh, they gave everybody devices. And because uh, the, way that, the way that it works is they, uh, they choose the days they work. They have to work three days in the office, two days at home. Everybody uh, generally comes in on Wednesday. But one of the, uh, one of the aspects of the uh, study was that they found that by enabling technology and endpoint devices outside of the office was a clear employee satisfaction opportunity for Social Security Administration as one of the reasons that it's a, uh, it's a great place to work. And what I would say is that I think the government has an opportunity to reflect what's happening in the broader world, which is that people want mobility, they want access, access. and the reality is that most of us, our children included, 
think about their work device as one life. They, they do everything from their work life to their personal life, back to their work life in any given day. And they want one single uh, device to be able to go do that. And I think there's an opportunity for the government to start to reflect that uh, their workforce is changing. And in order for them to embrace Gen Z millennials into their workforce, which represents, frankly, potentially a cost savings, but also a new approach to, uh, to how they have employee engagement, part of endpoint devices is part of the how they go help achieve that objective. One thing uh, in terms of government can learn from industry in addition is that the CISO position is often still a sort of more focused on how am I complying with um, FATARA baseline or FISMA, et cetera. And in industry, the person who has the, the, the equivalent job, sometimes called a CISO, now often called the chief risk officer, and they're thinking about risk management broadly. You're seeing government move in this direction in terms of risk management. Um, I'll work in artificial intelligence. There, there, there's a whole new set of risks around data, uh, around AI, and AI and risk management is sort of an evolving field at the academic level in terms of uh, sort of understanding that spectrum of issues. So I think government can learn from, from industry in terms of risk management and then uh, follow a lot of the research in terms of how AI and blockchain and other uh, uh, cool things that are coming are creating sort of benefits but also risks to be managed and how to kind of frame that into the overall risk management portfolio. So I think arguably the most important word that came out of this study, out of Suzette's uh, talk, out of everything that you guys have been saying is having a holistic view of these issues. Um, and I think understanding how to link your approaches to security from the way that you procure endpoints all the way up to your, your agency level and then you know OMB level uh, network visibility and network layer security solutions. So when you think about kind of how do you create that cohesive view and cohesive discussion and that layered policy, what do you think are the most important steps that the government needs to take in order to get to that point? Sure. We, I mean, we have a NIST framework that the government and industry worked out. Uh, how about starting there? It's, it's built into and baked into the President's executive order. So identify, protect, detect, respond, recover is a good place to start. You can map then the technical controls to that in your different environments throughout the kill chain, whether that's ISO or the NIST technical standards. There's, you know, it's, it's important, and we're, we struggle with this um, all the time on standards, right? To, to get the level of specificity to be effective balanced with a level of specificity that doesn't drive you in the wrong direction towards compliance. And so um, I, I think that's a, a good starting point to give the flexibility for people to implement with high level goals. All of that builds towards a risk reduction model. So you need to be able to articulate how what you're doing throughout the network um, from the operational side, through the procurement side, and the contracting side, identifies your greatest risk. Suzette talked also about um, being smart and how you target truly high-value high assets. And DHS, they just had their risk summit yesterday, and it was focused on critical functions. So um, looking across uh, what matters most to your enterprise and how are you driving down risk through the five principles of identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, I think is a, is a good approach, and I think the, the government is wise to have started that way, and we'll see how they implement in that direction. I think that, that touches on one of the other uh, key themes that I think is going to grow in importance over the next few years. So, Todd, you mentioned you know that uh, everyone goes after the printer, and while I know that uh, working for HP, you probably have an a, a unusual Slightly affinity for printers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I think the reality is that most printers that the government buys are purchased uh, from the consumer channel. Um, in fact, a growing share of all of the devices that the government is procuring, that the government's using, that are becoming part of government networks are coming from the consumer channel. Ryan, you mentioned the NIST framework, which was a partnership between NIST and the government and uh, industry partners to develop a, a framework, a set of standards, an approach to security um, that could help not only the government, but also the broader uh, community, particularly critical infrastructure operators. So how can the government think about pushing out higher standards of security to the broader tech industry if the government's going to be buying from the consumer channel, from the enterprise channel, not buying their own dedicated products and services, how do you raise that standard so that what you get off the shelf 
at the lowest price possible as a government procurement officer is something that can meet the high standards and, and higher security needs of a government agency. Yeah, you know, I, I actually think um, one place we are all going to be focused in the very near term is the Cybersecurity Act that just passed in Europe uh, mm -hmm. overnight, and they have not yet published the final text. Spent a lot of time on that because there is a certification regime within that. Um, so uh, while the, the U.S. Uh, government sort of, I think we're talking about the procurement capabilities and whether or not that can drive a market here in the U.S., uh, the NIST framework is a voluntary framework. The European standard may be a barrier to entry if you're, if you're going to sell in that market. And so depending on what the final text looks like, I think it's going to be very important to see how that comes out and whether or not it drives higher security or it creates unintended consequences. Right? I always go back to uh, FISMA in 2002 required a report every, you probably know this, every two or three years you had to produce a paper report three. Of the, the, every three the, years you, on the status yeah. of your network, Correct. right? The cottage industry. Not just your network, but all your applications. All your applications, right? So the cottage industry that grew up to create the information that went in that report, to print that report, and to generate it, which was completely useless from a security perspective, didn't pro provide you any insight into what was actually going on in your network, actually took time and resources and people away from securing your enterprise. That is always a potential within a, within a mandatory standards regime. So getting that right balance between uh, specificity as well as flexibility to adapt, whether it's to new threats, to incorporate emerging technologies, or to ensure that it fits the particular needs of, of your enterprise is an important one. Um, you asked about sort of government driving standards into the consumer space, and there's sort of, I think, a tail and a dog question as to which is the tail and which is the dog in that, in that um, setting. In, in other words, there is a set of expectations in the consumer space around safety that may not the market may not be there where, where users have the right security incentives yet. And I think that's where the partnership, where government can learn about, a lot about technology from industry. But in terms of, of industry learning from government, it may be that sort of the risk profile of when government uses an application and something goes wrong, it, the, the risk in terms of, of volume and in terms of political risk, in terms of, of funding risk, is significant and national and can, you know, can, be, uh, can lead to significant issues even among nation states. So educating and having the dialogue both where government's learning from industry sort of what's the best practice in from a technical perspective that we've been discussing and industry also learning sort of <coughs> what are the user demands from government so that they can, it's not just going to benefit industry when they're selling to government as the risk, un, as the understanding of risk at the endpoint sort of permeates and, and our kids get a little bit more risk aware. My kids are not risk aware right now <laughs> um, as, they, as they get into the workforce and so that be, creates a greater demand. I think it will create a, a higher sort of risk profile going forward. I'm going to attack this a little bit differently, right? And uh, the reality is that all of us uh, love online marketplaces. The ease of being able to procure products online in a very efficient manner is, uh, is very attractive to us as consumers. It's attractive to the, uh, to the government. The reality is that today's current marketplace, when uh, you look at online marketplaces, if I'm a uh, CIO in a government agency, I personally would not allow our folks to, uh, to those folks to purchase from an online standpoint, because from a technology standpoint, the number one risk is counterfeiting. Absolutely, the uh, number one risk, whether it's devices, whether it's uh, supplies, whatever it may be, because the ability to determine the supply chain custody of that individual product is highly compromised. That said, the National Defense Authorization Act that just uh, was approved not that many uh, months ago, there was a provision within that act that talked about developing online marketplaces. Um, and they instructed the GSA to come back in 18 months with a framework around what that looks like. And, uh, and the GSA has already started by leveraging industry in terms of what that framework looks like. Uh, and, and, uh, and what should be the requirements in order to compete in that online marketplace. So I think online marketplaces are here to stay. I think there's uh, efficiencies that come from that. Um, I think it can, can lower overall cost, but supply chain um, security has to be an aspect of that um, if we're to take security seriously. 
So you bring us to our last, I think, key buzzword that we have to touch on today, which is um, you talk about uh, people buying from online marketplaces in their official capacity. But I think the other big question when it comes to endpoints connecting to federal networks is going to be BYOD, uh, bring your own device. Um, this is a big question, I think, for every enterprise, uh, the federal government just being a kind of a, a bigger, badder enterprise. Um, but can we do BYOD safely? in the federal government, um, and, and what, would you, what would you say to folks who manage federal networks who are thinking about how you could do BYOD, how you can allow your employees to have that capability in their professional space? As you mentioned, they want one device to be their professional and their personal life. How do we make that possible, but how do we do it securely given that all kinds of devices, real or fake, from all sorts of sources, you know, uh, Chinese, Russian, and otherwise, uh, are going to be becoming a part of your network. You know, so my personal opinion is that while there's a lot of um, uh, folks that want BYOD and they think there's associated cost savings as a result of that, when you actually look at all the numbers, and we've seen these uh, these pictures before, when they have a picture of an iceberg and they and they look at it, and all you see is the uh, the small peak of an iceberg, and you think about that as your cost, and then beneath it you see the larger piece of the iceberg, which is your actual total cost. And I what I think is going to happen uh, is I don't believe BYOD will be a uh, program that's uh, aggressively endorsed by the government. What I think will happen is what's happened with the cloud. And so it wasn't five years ago when I was meeting with a CIO of a large financial institution and they said, over my dead body, will we ever let our data exist in the cloud? Five years later, they have no data that's on premises. Zero data that's on premises. Is that guy dead? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The same thing that's happening in the government, which is that there's a, uh, what I would call the opportunity for agencies to acquire when they need it, how they need it, and how they're going to use it on a SIP basis. And so we call it as a service or device as a service. And what I think you'll see agencies start to adopt is how can they more efficiently deliver products, get out of the business of managing assets, acquiring them, um, imaging them, managing them, disposing of them. How do they reduce life cycles so they can tr introduce devices that are more elegant? Because the primary reason that people want to go to BYOD is they want the next cool device. They want their next iPhone, if you will, as soon as it release. And what as a service allows you to do is to be able to have a more rapidly changing uh, dynamic as it, as it uh, applies to individual assets. And it helps solve that problem, but, my, but more importantly, helps address the security risks associated with that. I don't know. I know a few people in government service who will cling to their 2002 BlackBerry for yeah, the rest of their yeah, lives. Yeah, exactly. but. <laughs> I miss the keypad, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I think that um, you know, agencies are going to make different risk-based decisions on, on BYOD. I think that if, you th from, a, from a policy standpoint, sort of a NIST OMB, you know, DHS issuing some operational guidance, is to build in sort of um, the access piece, you know, and derived credentials um, is significant in, in a device credentialing uh, a scenario, um, and having that be sort of a, a default, if you maybe not default, but a preferred mechanism in terms of, of securing uh, an asset management understanding. So there's uh, the sort of the proliferation of devices and making sure that they're recorded in the agency's asset inventory. Just if a user brings in a BYOD device, it, there, it ought to be visible from asset management perspective, just the same as it was issued by the agency. And then sort of, a, 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 I guess, a, a data uh, protection layer, um, because as they're logging in, um, it could increase, for example, the insider threat vector, um, because if people are coming in with different types of devices, there are going to be more opportunities uh, to get in. So understanding what's there, how they get in, and sort of protecting that, and then once they're in, being able to track the, the information responsibly are three significant pieces of a policy toward that. And I'd say, yes, it's possible. It happens throughout industry. I believe it happens in government as well in, in many places. So absolutely there is the ability to have a secure BYOD. Um, we're moving to a software defined world right now. I mean, all, many of our businesses are, are shifting in that direction. Ours, for example, we overwhelmingly sold hardware in the beginning. We now virtualize our firewall capability that all of our, all of our endpoint security is software derived. So 
there's the ability to um, deliver the same security. Again, it, it goes to a holistic approach from the endpoint to software-defined networking um, throughout your entire enterprise. But it can be done. It is being done right now, and, and the government should be doing it you know, based on best practices and standards. All right, I know we have uh, a, a number of folks in our audience uh, who may have questions here, so I want to open it up to everyone. Uh, I think Kathy has a mic back there, so uh, if you have a question, um, please do make it a question. Um, then if you want to raise your hand uh, and wait for the mic and then uh, introduce yourself before you ask your question. Aaron Boyd from Nexco. Uh, we heard Suzette mention that the tick policy, the updated tick policy is going to be coming out. I know DHS has been, been waiting for that so they can get work started there. Some of the things they've been talking about is the problem with the fact that endpoints have really decimated the border these days. They're, it's hard to, to create that. So what advice do you have uh, for the, the upcoming tick policy? What would you like to see in it to address the reality of where we are today? Were you in when tick came out? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. What would you have done differently? You go first. <laughs> well, I, it, Tick came out at a different point in time in architecture, right. right? So the thought behind that was to replicate what was done in the Defense Department, which was to know where departments and agencies connect to the internet and then have trusted internet connections so that they had on-ramps and off-ramps. And then they applied technology and capability on top of that. A technology and capability is remarkably limited. It's the, the on-ramp, off-ramp uh, off architecture does not match certainly to a cloud environment. Um, I, I think it made sense certainly at the time to identify where networks were connected to the internet because we had no idea of the denominator, right? And so what came after that was Einstein 1 and Einstein 2, which were applied uh, in, in those access points. E3A is applied by the internet service provider at, at a different location. But one and two was NetFlow. So one was NetFlow, two is intrusion detection systems. Then we saw these GAO reports that said uh, intrusions have gone way up and data exfil has gone way up. We just didn't know that it was being exfilled. So there was, there was utility to that at the time. There, if those access points are still being used, that's great. But we need to holistically look, again, uh, not just at this sort of wall and moat idea, right? But every access point, regardless of, of your infrastructure, should be a place to collect data mm -hmm. and to enforce security. And so the perimeter is both nowhere and everywhere, and we need to apply things like software-defined networking and zero trust, Suzette mentioned. So security capabilities on top of segmenting your network using software, that's down to the endpoint layer, and it's, it's within your data center, in your virtual environment, across cloud service providers and, and within your cloud as well. Cover your thoughts as I well, agree. Dan. Absolutely. All right. Other questions? <laughs> Hello, thank you for your presentation. I'm Margaret Cope um, with Serve USA. Um, yesterday I was at a briefing with uh, NASA CIO and there was a discussion about a product for monitoring um, computers called Quick Fix that IBM developed, and it was a great tool for monitoring the status of many different um, parameters. And they used it a lot, but they said that it was sold to an Indian corporation. Um, is there another tool like that in the, the works, or um, can you? Um, Elaborate a little bit more on that tool. Okay, so uh, just a, as a caveat, so at IBM, my day job is I run a think tank that's independent right. of the business, so I'm not speaking for the company um, in talking about this. Um, but the capabilities that, that IBM and other companies, um, HP, many other companies, are using to uh, understand what's happening in the networks that they're supporting um, and uh, uh, basically to, to take a, an approach like the one that Ryan just described are built into a lot of the product offerings that I know our company is developing and I know that other companies are, are taking advantage of. So, so while the particular product may move up beyond, there's, there's a whole suite of security services that um, afterwards I'd be happy to put you in touch with our security team um, who could sort of direct you to where that capability rests because I know it does in the suite of services that, that we have uh, and we can, we can follow up. I would just add on to that. So as the industry moves to as a service, 
uh, even companies like HP, we have an analytics tool that does exactly what you're asking to do. The same way that we manage our own fleet is that companies are going to be required to understand where the asset is, uh, what does the software profile look like that, what does the security profile look on it, and more importantly is that we've been able to develop telemetry that's built into the system that can determine the device's health and understand from a health perspective whether that device is, uh, is operating efficiently, uh, is overused, should, we, should that uh, employee have a more powerful machine, potentially a, uh, a less powerful machine, and or is it about to fail predictably, predictably um, so that we can uh, address it before it happens. Because in a lot of cases, hardware failure, the way that you determine you have hardware failure is it doesn't work anymore. Wouldn't it be nice to understand that it's not about to work anymore and to be proactive about that? Other questions? Hello, uh, Dan Vasquez, CEO of uh, IntelliWings. How do you feel uh, encryption should fit into this? Uh, I'm working with a partner company called Fornetics. Not sure if you've heard of them. They've invented a, an encryption key management system that can manage hundreds of millions of encryption keys to secure individual endpoint devices. Would encryption be something that you think is uh, important for securing endpoints? Yeah, data at rest, data in transit. Um, absolutely, encryption is important. Buzzword time. Quantum may fundamentally change that, right? I said so, it first. I said it first. Yeah, but I used it in the context. Oh, there. Yeah, yeah, all right, like all right. In the Q and A session too. Um, so, um, whether or not quant whether or not encryption can be um, still relevant in a post quantum environment is going to be an important thing, and we should be de dedicating, by the way, tremendous resources to that. Um, the proliferation of encryption that we've seen, particularly in the post Snowden world, is a lot of proprietary encryption. So at the network level, we've traditionally, first you would scan the traffic, then you saw increasing um, uh, SSL encryption. Um, increasingly as that becomes proprietary and difficult to decode at the network level, that was part of, from a company strategy, we wanted to be holistic and that's why we moved to the, to the endpoint because at some point you need to operate that. It usually operates on the endpoint and therefore it decrypts itself at, at that point. And so encryption has already greatly impacted the security industry. Uh, I'd note also encryption that can't be opened at the network level means that it can be a vehicle for delivery of malicious activity as well. And so that's another place that that we've evolved uh, in the security industry to focus on the endpoint because that's sort of where the action happens. And, and I'll take up your mantle on quantum. There's a lot of research now around homomorphic encryption that can basically adapt at scale and speed uh, as quantum gets rolled out. And I think that'll be a key part of the sort of how do we secure quantum uh, as it gets to a sort of a scale and even into a commercial space. Homomorphic is a really good, that's extra points. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that is extra points. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you uh, explain any, cryptocurrency, well, this is game over. <laughs> oh, we go. now we're going to use blockchain, <laughs> is that right? Okay. Uh, anyone who can work uh, security of the internet of things into their next question uh, gets <laughs> extra points as well. John? Uh-oh. Yeah, no, we're <laughs> yeah. yeah, hi. Uh, John Agengas from AT&T, and I'm on vacation today, so I'm not speaking on behalf of AT&T, <laughs> okay. but and I'm the only guy older than Dan here, so. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things we, we've talked about, the, you know, the, the trend towards endpoints and mobility. I mean, everybody wants their endpoint to be, go with me wherever I want it to be, whether it's a BYOD, and BYOD seemed, the discussion seems to have gone the way of the, uh, discussion about the cyber uh, underwriters laboratory. But I'll get to my question, okay. The, uh, uh, what we see happening, in, uh, particularly in the mo mobile space, is the trend is to move the computing resources, which will typically be cloud, closer to the end point, mm -hmm. away from, yeah, there'll still be things in the, in the data center and cloud services, but as you get closer to the uh, uh, things like smart cities and self-driving cars, you need to compute closer to the endpoints because of the latency concerns and that's where 5G is trying to go. Mm -hmm. So how does that affect your vision of uh, you know, security at the endpoint as these computing resources that support the endpoint become more and more distributed? I think, Ryan, you mentioned the 11 uh, you know, agents on the end device and how many more can fit on a, uh, you know, a compute device and still compute. Yep. Uh, so we're, we're kind of in this uh, netherworld of how do we get close to the endpoint and protect the endpoint while the resources that are supporting that endpoint, whether it's an application or whether it's a smart city and a big sense, uh, you know, it's, it's 
the environment keeps changing, and we'll always have to keep up with that. But what are your thoughts on terms of endpoint security in this mobile environment with resources moving closer to that endpoint? And throw in drones and self-driving cars and things get And all those dicey. things, yeah. Mm. Uh, I think that um, certainly sort of distributed analytics uh, that can, can itself work at a different level of, of the cloud, if you will, while, while everybody's kind of moving around these devices uh, and, and uh, d information is closer to the endpoint, having the analytics that traditionally, if you were a, a systems engineer or, or monitor, you could kind of see in your network, having the ability to look across, whether it's um, in, in a large-scale analytic network that's driven uh, by um, uh, devices coming into a, a single network or to multiple nodes that you have visibility into, and then I'll work in artificial intelligence again to build in AI into the analysis so that you can sort of respond quickly is probably part of the way that we will see the industry evolving and government can learn from that in terms of looking at, at, at a data picture that's evolving as these devices travel through cities and states and capturing that data and understanding what the cyber risk is in real time and being able to respond in a way kind of like an E3A, where you're actually responding to an incident and being able to throw that back into the network, wherever that network sits. Yeah, and I, I so we certainly are seeing a lot of computing um, on the device itself, but I, it, it is less effective if not connected to a uh, cloud computing capability as well. So we'll render a verdict, yay or nay, or maybe, uh, on the endpoint itself, then connected to a cloud if the user chooses to send those files up there, that has a far greater speed capability. And so um, our APT detection is fundamentally cloud-based. In five minute intervals, it can take a new file, render a verdict, develop a preventative measure, and push it out to 55,000 enterprises around the world. That's done at a scale of 1.6 million new preventative measures uh, every week. So that can't be done on an individual device and the, the ecosystem doesn't get the benefit if everybody's individual device is replicating that. So we're leveraging cloud technology in that case for the benefit of the endpoint and the benefit of the network user um, with, with an off-premise sort of backbone. All right, unfortunately we are running out of time. I want to give each of our panelists an opportunity to, uh, to, to give us any closing thoughts. Uh, you have 90 seconds. I talked a lot. Huh? <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Uh, we uh, we think uh, all right. <laughs> you're all done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I learned a few things from you. Right, Take, so, up. Take a knee. Yeah. The um, the reality is that when you think about uh, endpoint devices, there's a couple of takeaways that I had, which was uh, the fact is there's an opportunity for government to think about security as part of how they procure their product. Right? What are the requirements? And bolted onto that is what is the supply chain that comes along with that. So I think if we could uh, take a leadership mantle to help, deliver, uh, help our, uh, our colleagues and government agencies see that opportunity as part of their security practice, I think we'll, uh, we'll come, have come a long way. Uh, I would say um, we talk a lot about protection at the data layer, not so much about data protection in a sort of a GDPR sense, and we're living in a world where there's- Ooh, another you know, good one. Yeah, yeah, uh, a <laughs> lot of, of policy, whether it's coming from that regime or from other regimes that will be developing around the world, including potential privacy legislation that we, that we may see here in coming years. Um, so understanding how to link the security discussion that we're talking about with a data protection strategy, as Suzette talked about, the data strategy for the government, and I think as they move forward and they think about how do they link those two is a, is a place that we can all, government, industry, academia, kind of work together to help educate government. Yeah, and it I think the report highlights, th this is not something that we need to create. The government needs to better leverage existing technology and, uh, and innovation that's going on right now. There are process changes that can drive that and, and there's, there's the ability to put better tools in the hands of operators fast and we've got a roadmap for that. We just need to execute at this point. All right, well I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, please join me in thanking this fantastic group. Great, thank you. Thanks.